Have you ever wanted to launch a friend or perhaps an enemy into the sun? <laughs> I know I have. I can think of a couple people I'd like to launch into the sun. But why don't we throw things into the sun? Why don't we throw mm, our ashes into the sun as a cool way of being buried? Or why don't we launch our trash, maybe our nuclear waste, into the sun? It sounds like it'd be simple. You just point a rocket at the sun and bing, boom. But getting to the sun is a lot harder than you think. In fact, it's easier to escape the solar system than it is to send a rocket to the sun and let me explain why so the earth is going around the sun at a very high orbital speed like 30 kilometers per second 700,000 miles per hour so as we're doing that and going around the sun if we wanted to launch at the sun we would basically have to stop our rocket from that orbital speed and then go towards the sun because if you fired the rocket while the earth was still in its orbital motion and therefore you still had the orbital motion you would miss the sun so you have to basically cancel out all of that orbital velocity 30 kilometers per second which is a lot some estimates that i could find say that you could launch a few kilograms into the sun for about a billion dollars oh and once you canceled out all that velocity it would take about 65 days for something around the orbit of the earth to fall all the way into the sun a billion dollars 65 days. Is it worth it to launch, I don't know, someone into the sun? And welcome to another edition of Footnotes, the companion show to Because Science, where I take all of your comments, questions, and corrections, and I launch a rocket of science at them. And then I tell you what's coming up next on this channel. Hint, it's about this. And it was also an HBO show that didn't disappoint a lot of people. But getting right into it, in the last episode of Because Science, we were trying to figure out why Thor isn't immune to electricity. In movies like the first Thor and Thor Ragnarok, we see Thor being more or less tased or space tased. But if he can control lightning and he's the god of thunder, why is that possible? Why? I said that he might have something more technical going on like Thor's Asgardian skin effect, or Taze if you will. He exhibits a significant skin effect which would route most of the lightning's voltage around his body and not through his body so he could stay relatively safe, but something that is a low frequency weapon like a taser could go through his body and shock him big beef muscles up. But what did you have to say? The first comment comes from Akik, who says, I feel like this is a better explanation for why Iron Man survived Thor's lightning than how the shock collar works. Well, that's an interesting point. If Iron Man is really a metal man, if he's wearing a suit made out of metal, and Thor shoots a lightning bolt at him, then that lightning, if it was like Earth lightning, would still have a significant skin effect, especially when encountering a metal conductor, a very good conductor like Tony's suit might be. So if that was the case, then the lightning could flow mostly around his suit and into the ground like it does when lightning strikes the roof of your car and it goes around the chassis of the car rather than directly through it most of the time. So yes, that does explain how Iron Man could be Thor-proof? Ish? Huh? I can't go higher than that. Javier Nicolas Busamante Correa says, ground current, huh? Uh, that's one of the ways that lightning can kill you. Actually, the most likely way that lightning can kill you when lightning strikes the ground, but the voltage spreads out in every direction along the ground, looking for a place to go through, which might be up your leg, cross your heart, down the leg, and hope to die, or however that goes. So uh, Javier says, ground current, huh? So Snoke intended to kill Kyle Ren. So, Snoke intended to kill Kylo Ren at the beginning of The Last Jedi, not just electrocute him. Yeah, so looking at the footage, Snoke does exactly that, which looks like a streamer or ground current, and if that's the case, then yes, a Sith Lord could more effectively deal with uh, opponents if he or she shot electricity into the ground as a kind of ground current strike. That current found someone's body and went up and through them, doing more damage than a direct strike might, so this would be just another way that a Sith Lord could kill you. But that's not something the Jedi would tell you. <laughs> Ironic. Life! Blaze Storm says, the talk about electromagnetic makes me interested in how those floating magnetic trains work. Yeah, so interestingly, magnetic levitation trains or maglev trains use some of the same principles that we were talking about in this episode, specifically eddy currents. So when you have superconducting magnets and metal uh, rails and electricity going on, what the maglev trains do is they move in relation to those magnets. And like we said, when you have a changing magnetic field from those magnets, that can create uh, an opposing magnetic field and an opposing electrical current that acts in opposition to what created it. So when you have these trains moving along the track with a magnet
magnets and electricity, you have these eddy currents that are created between the magnets and the metal rails that kind of push against each other. These magnetic fields are repelling each other, which acts to lift the train up off the track. And without the friction of the train track, just air resistance, these trains can go a lot, lot faster. And that's how magnetic levitation works. Another. Yannick Tanzler says, fun fact, the band name ACDC also stands for Alternating Current Direct Current, or ACDC, in rock context, since this is the abbreviation that Malcolm and Angus Young based their band's name on. Well, I think I knew that ACDC stood for ACDC, but I wasn't sure exactly which ACDC they meant. So uh, that's good knowledge, I guess. ACDC. <laughs> But the nerdiest comment at the time I'm filming this episode is a bit more serious and I want to get into it. Uh, it comes from Jason Beard who said, my family's whole herd of cattle died when they were lying underneath a big tree that got struck by lightning. The lightning zapped them all through the roots apparently. So uh, like I said in the episode, this unfortunately happens a lot. When livestock get scared, they all huddle near a tree or a fence and then the lightning strikes maybe the tree or the fence directly and either they're touching it or it goes to the ground or what have you and they all die in mass. It's very, very said. So first of all, let me just say, I'm sorry for your cattle loss. But there is an interesting effect that's actually going on here. Why does it seem that cattle and livestock are much more easily killed by lightning? Well, it's kind of a simple explanation if you think about it. So when lightning goes to the ground and ground current that can easily kill us and it goes up one of our legs across our body and then down out the other, that's a relatively speaking small path. We're not very wide. But now think of how a cow standing on the ground presents itself. If you have four legs, then you have lightning going up one side, traveling, relatively speaking, much further along the body before it goes out back into the ground. Because they're on all fours and because they're much longer than us when on all fours, the lightning has more opportunity to travel through more tissue than it does through us, which leads to more damage and potentially more deaths of livestock. It's an interesting little quirk and it's an unfortunate little quirk and it's very fascinating in a kind of morbid way. But thanks for sharing that with us, James. And for that, you are indeed a super nerd. <sighs> Here, take it. It's yours. Well, our first correction is kind of an obvious one, and I'm upset about it. Uh, it comes from Benjamin Aid, Bittersweet Topaz, Eb Gore, Frequent Commenter, uh, who all say, near the end of the episode, I said that if Valkyrie had a high-frequency space taser that she could affect Thor, which is the opposite of what I was saying the entirety of the episode, that you want low frequency if you want to shock Thor. And let me just throw that out there. Yeah, I slipped up. What you might not know about the way that I film Because Science is that uh, we film it all in one go. We don't space it out over days or even that many hours. I film an entire episode in about three hours, and if it seems like I'm more, you know, red-faced or tired near the end of the episode, that's because I've been speaking nonstop for three hours. So <laughs> Sometimes I slip up and I don't catch it and I'm tired, so I don't want to do it again. And that was like take number 20 of that, like literally. So at some point you just gotta cut your losses, son. Our next correction comes from a number of you like Kumar and Jack and J.O. and Segi Masta and others who say, well, of course Thor isn't immune to electricity. He's the god of thunder, not the god of lightning. <laughs> yeah, no, I know it's that it's implied that you know, thunder is the sound that lightning makes. It's more so the lightning part. You know, you don't really care about the thunder. You worry about what comes after the lightning. It's... Our next correction comes from Titan of Titans, Mick Cillian, Danny Adam, and others who say, well, we also see lightning coming out of Thor's eyeballs? How do you explain that? The short answer to that is that I can't. The longer, more apologetic to the canon answer is that uh, maybe because it's a skin effect, the lightning that is coming out of Thor's eyeballs, or he says, is coursing through my veins in Endgame. It's more of a metaphor, and on his eyeballs, it's just on the surface of his eyeballs, and not like in through his brain. Or it could just be inside of his eyeballs and nowhere else. I don't know how Asgardian lightning works. I don't know how any of this works. I'm just... I'm just making up, I'm just, I'm using science, I'm trying to come up with the best theories, but sometimes the writers just don't care. Why would they care? They're making a movie. <laughs> 
Nicholas Young says, doesn't this mean that Thor can be electrocuted by a high voltage, high current, direct current power source? Yes, yeah, so what we didn't really go into is that direct current, like you can get from a battery, for example, doesn't exhibit a skin effect at all. It just flows through everything that it can. So yes, you could shock Thor with a car battery. Like that. You could shock Thor with a car battery if you wanted to. He wouldn't like it. Oh, and it'd be easier to shock Thor with a car battery if, you know, he was using his lightning powers and all his clothes blew off first. Zap. Are you, are you cold? I'm not cold. That's acting. But the nerdiest comment at the time I'm filming this episode, I'm giving to two time super nerd already, Ninja Bear Films, who says, first off, Valkyrie didn't create the taser discs. The Grandmaster says he invented them. Uh, 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 what? Uh, and they don't require special knowledge of Asgardian physiology. As long as a space taser disc can puncture the uh, co Kotati metal fibers Gamora compares Thor's muscles to, then it would be easy to overwhelm the electrical pulses uh, the muscles use uh, to contract in order to trigger the muscle spasm that you see. But it still requires a large change to affect more than the localized muscles it is attached to, which would drain the battery on those little discs very fairly quickly, and it should be easy to pull off since it's only piercing the skin. But if we assume that he couldn't pull it off, it was embedding deeper into his body, perhaps microfibers extending into the body to connect directly to his nervous system. Then it would require a very small charge to overwhelm the natural charge in Thor's nervous system and cause spasms throughout the body. And the disc would remain effective for longer without using, losing charge. Ooh, threw up a little bit. And while a number of you pointed this out is that if you had uh, shocking in Thor's nervous system, that's what it could actually be doing. Say the space taser wasn't a taser at all, it just affected his nervous system. Many of you said that in the YouTube comments. I will point out that affecting your nervous system is exactly what a taser does. It interferes with electrical signals in your body and in your muscles, your cardiac muscles, and it can immobilize you that way. So affecting your nervous system is still what the taser is doing and the space taser can do the same, whether that's through chemicals or electrical shock. If it's still getting at the nervous system, the taser aspect of this still kind of works. But Ninja Bear Films laid it all out very uh, quickly and concisely. So for that, you are now a three time oh, super nerd. Ah, ah, ah. Trips. Now, on this week's episode of Because Science, we're talking about something a little bit more serious. I want to explain to you why the radioactive lava at the bottom of Chernobyl is still hot. That's right, on this week's episode of Because Science, we're going in a little bit of a different direction. So instead of theorizing and trying to figure out what happens in these fantastical worlds, we're looking at the worst nuclear disaster in human history. I've been fascinated by Chernobyl and nuclear physics for a long time. In fact, I used to write about it before I did any kind of video in the void stuff. So now is as good a time as any to talk about the engineering, the physics, and the lethality of what Chernobyl is, was, and left behind. So that is this week's episode. I hope you find it as interesting as I do and as everyone on HBO does and will not stop telling me to watch. I get it. Look, I canceled right after Game of Thrones. Sansa, you play the Game of Thrones. And other times, you sound like an American, but not. So go watch the latest episode of Because Science if you haven't yet. It's all about, oh, <laughs> Thor and why he's not immune to electricity like you think he might be. And leave me all of your nerdiest comments, corrections, and questions at youtube.com slash because science, facebook.com slash because science, and at because science on Instagram and Twitter. And don't forget, no matter who or what you want to throw into the sun, it's too expensive. Find a cheaper way to dispose of it.